Record. Here we go. We are broadcasting live from France, Australia, Connecticut, and Florida. Um, and I can't compete with uh, what we just talked about, David and, and, and company here about other parts of the world, but that's not bad. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for being here today. It's, uh, I'm seeing the list populate lots of uh, friends. Um, I'm not gonna single you out, but thank you all for being here. Um, the, uh, the guilty party in all this um, is Glenn and he's uh, managed to sneak out of the room and not take the consequences. So we'll have to get to him later, but uh, uh, my uh, joy in knowing David and his colleagues here is a result of my friend, Glenn Miles. Um, who has successfully um, also temporarily moved out of the city and enjoying living in Connecticut. Um, thank you all again for being here today. We have uh, learned a lot about what's going on with Test Zone, which is the topic of the discussion today in the last month or so. And I've had the joy and pleasure of learning from David and his colleagues and studying this. And uh, uh, obviously, the science goes over my head, but you're going to see, as I did, how relevant it is, not just in the, um, the time of COVID, but uh, in the time of workplaces, being cautious about what they're doing with their employees and so forth. So we're going to um, uh, just a little do a little Zoom housekeeping here. You, you all are very familiar. Um, being that this is in... Uh, I, I know we generally have folks pitching, but this is a luminary series, uh, which means that we're bringing an awareness about people who are doing notable things in the world. And so even if you wanted to invest in it, you couldn't, so there. Um, and so um, uh, we, we would just want to bring awareness about what David and his colleagues are doing and my friend Glenn, and uh, as it relates to what's going on in the world today. There's Glenn. Welcome. I just made, I just, uh, Glenn, I just, uh, you just missed me uh, spearing arrows at you. You probably can't hear me either. So um, again, uh, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A in the chat box. I'll be paying attention. And uh, we're going to go through some uh, basic overview here, introductions, and then we'll get into the meat of the matter. Super interesting stuff. Thank you all for spending your time with us today. And welcome, David. Can you take it away? You're on mute. Hi, guys. Um, I'm David Greenstein. Uh, I'm the one of the co-founders uh, of Testzone, um, a young company, um, a company uh, we believe has incredible re relevance and uh, relevance that has has come to the fore because of uh, of the things that have been happening to us all over the last year. Um, today, we, we're going to, uh, A, introduce you to three of our four founders, um, Mike uh, Reed, uh, a PhD with an incredible um, history and career as the chief science officer at uh, some very impressive uh, diagnostic uh, development labs, and my good friend, uh, another Australian, uh, I think a fr friend of Mike's from childhood, uh, Gus, uh, another PhD. I'm surrounded by so many PhDs, it's incredible. Um, and, and Gus comes to us. He's actually broadcasting live from the south of France right now. Uh, but he he's, uh, has uh, had an, an impressive career, um, including uh, a long stint at Sanofi Pasteur in vaccine development, and especially uh, with the, the view to how vaccines get implemented and human behavior around vaccine and infectious diseases. Our, our partner and, and founder, uh, co-founder, uh, Elliot Cowan, is not with us today, but he, is, um, he has an, uh, an incredible career running one of the large divisions of the FDA uh, for diagnostic devices for many, many years. So we all came together around a common mission um, to do something to help people protect themselves. Um, I'm a, 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 a serial entrepreneur, but I, I, I spent 13 years uh, as a CEO of two public companies. And uh, 
the one thing that we thought about uh, when, you, when you're a CEO is always your fiduciary responsibilities. Like, how do you protect yourself, your company, uh, your pipeline, your customers, your, em, em, your, your, employee, your employees? And it's kind of second nature uh, when you sit on boards or when you sit in an executive role to think about um, the defensive things that one needs to do to, to be in business. And that's why uh, when COVID hit in March, I, I kind of came up with this idea that, that there was no real way for A, us as business people to anticipate uh, this arrival uh, the, the, and, and what happened thereafter. Um, it wasn't like we could write an insurance policy for it or, or, or follow a, a fire code for it. It, it, just, it just was this feeling of helplessness sitting and waiting for the cavalry. And, uh, and funnily enough, the cavalry never came. Uh, and, and, and even until today, many businesses are sitting waiting for the arrival of the brigade and uh, relying on some, traditional, on some traditional sources for that that haven't really come through. And so um, I, I was thinking why this is, why is it that in health security or in health care or in health generally, there was this lack of preparation and lack of ability for us as business people, business folks or people who run institutions to actually uh, protect ourselves, to be able to reach out to a provider who would help us, uh, perhaps a B2B provider that would help us. And, um, I came to the conclusion and then obviously surrounded myself with people who came to the same conclusion that one of the big issues is, is that health care is about care. Uh, the entire industry is focused on you get sick and then come to us and we'll make you better. So if you look at the structure of health care, it relies on people being sick to run the entire e economy of health care and everything structured around that. The pharma companies, the health providers, uh, the hospital systems, the insurance companies, the dance between the insurance companies and the health providers, uh, which we're all so used to uh, in this country. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the institutions, the governmental institutions that are set up to prop up and, and, and validate and control uh, these forces, uh, you know, the CDC, the FDA, NIH, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there, there wasn't really a view um, coming to say that one could actually do anything to protect yourself. There wasn't ever a view about security. It was much more a view about, um, about care. Almost to the extent that, can you imagine, like, because I know I have a fire department somewhere down the road here, I don't need to put smoke detectors in, in, in my house and I shouldn't have a fire extinguisher at the house because they'll be there. If my house starts burning, you know, the fire engine will come. And so nobody in any other genre of security actually relies on that. You take precautions, you put smoke detectors, you follow fire code, you have some local things, you have exits, uh, exit doors, you do fire drills. Uh, you wouldn't imagine running a large scale business without all of that preparation for fire, which might never happen. But with health, for some reason, this piece got missed. So, um, so we started thinking all together about how we fill that piece. How, how can we come up with services, uh, with ideas uh, to give solutions to businesses, enterprises and institutions to help them protect themselves? Uh, dealing primarily with COVID, but actually with a much longer view to, 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 to invent something, uh, to form something that doesn't exist. And, uh, and we basically know that we basically come from the point of view that security is a right. To secure yourself is a right. Uh, if you know uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need, it is one of the most essential needs uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, be a human. Uh, you need shelter, you need food, then you need security, and then you can go on to have relationships and family and love and fulfillment and, 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 and philanthropy and all the things that come after that. But if you don't have security, you can't get to the next level in the hierarchy of needs. And so, and security is there for almost everything else. You can pick up the phone, you can call Brinks if you've got, 
you know, um, uh, cash that you need delivered. Uh, you can call ADT if you want your house prevent, uh, uh, you know, uh, protected. Uh, you can put a, whatever it's called on your door uh, to see who's knocking. Uh, you know, in, 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 uh, obviously, you've got to go through the TSA to get on an aeroplane. Um, you, you put fire prevention in, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to health security, we all live in this kind of, we lived with this idea that, yes, there was the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And yes, there was this thing called SARS and this thing called Zika and this thing called, called, uh, called, called AIDS or this thing called Ebola. But it didn't really affect me. And the institutions were there to protect me eventually. Uh, quite, uh, quite well. The shock that came to us as business owners was that th the process works unless the process gets overrun. And that's what happened with COVID. And that's why it most probably took the great fire of London for people to start thinking we better start wondering about how to protect ourselves. So we think that this event, this global pandemic event that's here and it's around, it's gonna be around unfortunately for a while longer, is the prompt for businesses to, uh, to start to think about health security as a right and as a need and as a fiduciary responsibility of business leaders to do for their, for their businesses. So the way we thought about it is, and the what, why it's called test zone, is actually the world is divided into zones. Uh, these are areas, specific areas, areas, let's call them areas of control. I have a zone around me, it's my house, my family. We have a uh, necessity to protect ourselves here at the house. A business will have a, a retail store and have an office, a factory, and in, an educational institution is a zone. And zones can be small like a house or it can be large like an island nation. Uh, anything that can be defined by borders, uh, whatever those borders might be, but mostly defined by entrances ways into the spaces. And our basic idea in a nutshell is to move health from point of care to point of entry. In other words, how do we go about keeping disease, health threats, health security threats out in order to allow people in? It's almost the opposite of other types of security. It's, it's a welcoming security. It's a security that allows for human interaction, the thing that's unfortunately uh, uh, almost lost right now to, to most of the world. And so um, I reached out, uh, found some of the cleverest guys in the industry to join forces with me around this big idea and to start to think about processes and, um, and, and ideas and technologies that are available for us uh, to create this very, very special company. And um, I'm gonna hand it over, if you don't mind, Arthur, to Gus for a second, because Gus is one of the, 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 the brain, Gus and Mike are the brains here behind the, the actual uh, deliveries, uh, the, the, the models. And Gus will give you an example of a model, a model that we approach, for instance, COVID, and perhaps then afterwards, Mike will show you with a practical example of businesses that we actually, contracts that we actually have won, of how we actually apply that model in real time. And then we can come back and talk a little bit about the future, if that's okay with you. Yes, it's, it's great. Should we be thinking of this as the audience should be thinking of this in terms of the uh, public spaces and workplaces as the places that you're thinking about starting to protect? Yes, uh, we're thinking of, uh, we, we, if you go onto our website, you'll see the spaces. We, del we, we, we put them into different buckets. Um, um, workspaces, generally enterprise, we call it, uh, could be office blocks or, or, or campuses. It could be factories and essential manufacturing. It could be, as you'll hear very shortly, TV production, remote production locations for television. Um, it could be uh, sports and entertainment. It could be um, even uh, travel. Yeah. Kind of travel's the holy grail here. It's the hardest thing to do because you've got people arriving very quickly that need to be processed very quickly. So it's kind of, but we're much more now in the low hanging fruit where there's identified populations and very identified zones uh, that we can give immediate uh, attention and relief to. Yeah, fair enough. That's super helpful. Okay, carry on. Uh, Gus, do you want to uh, 
talk a little bit about cheese? Sure, <laughs> because you're in France. Well, here I'm in the south of France. We love talking about cheese. As Napoleon said, how can you possibly rule a country that has over 300 cheeses? And uh, that's a little bit, how do, you, how do you manage a pandemic? Maybe you'd have said the same thing. Um, hi, everybody. <clears throat> Maybe just two more words on who I am in this um, age of uh, where everybody's an expert on viruses and vaccines and coronavirus, etc. cetera. Um, I'm trained as a research scientist, PhD scientist. I've studied in that um, role variously the behavior of viruses, uh, the behavior of human cells, and the behavior of humans themselves. And all of these things <laughs> apply to uh, how we manage health threats, uh, like the pandemic that we're in at the moment. At UNICEF at the moment, I'm currently working on the behavioral determinants of vaccination, and vaccination is one of my uh, areas of expertise. Um, and I in advise countries on the implementation of vaccination programs. And that kind of gets to the crux of, of, of um, how our journey together took a step forward um, when I joined the conversation with Mike and David. So Mike is an expert in uh, tests and was advising the government uh, or helping the government evaluate many, many tests, different kinds of tests early on in the pandemic. And our starting point was tests. How can we use tests to bring that um, level of safety at the point of entry, as, as David said? And having worked on vaccines for many, many years, um, I knew that vaccines don't keep us safe from infectious diseases. It's vaccination programs that keep us safe. And uh, public health operates not uh, around a single solution, a single silver bullet, um, you know, a drug that solves everything. Public health always operates in programs. And, and by programs, we mean multiple layers of interventions that lay it over each other, um, bring a level of, of protection, of suppression of a disease uh, agent like, like the coronavirus or prevention of that, that, those uh, diseases getting into our spaces. And um, at, the, at this time, um, a, a concept was revived that I brought to the, to the team called the Swiss cheese model of COVID-19 prevention. And actually, Arthur, if I can share my screen, yep. I might just talk cheese for a minute. Okay, we can see it. Yeah. So we do love cheese in France. Um, we don't like Swiss cheese, we prefer French cheese. But um, everybody knows Swiss cheese. This is a model that's, that, that, that originated from um, a risk uh, mitigation model for businesses actually. And the idea here is that any one layer of cheese, any one intervention, so our starting point you see there, PCR testing or the rapid antigen testing, brings some protection, brings some um, ability to keep the virus out. But there's a hole, there are holes in each of the slices. And so on its own, one slice won't keep you safe. But when you start to layer these slices, and this is what test zone is doing. Test zone is offering layers of prevention, of protection against this virus at, at, in, in the current context. Temperature and symptom screening, the rapid antigen screening, more reliable PC, but slower PCR testing, um, follow up, contact tracing and quarantine or isolation. There's no point identifying people who are positive if we don't take them out of circulation. A simple, simple interventions that we know work. Wearing masks works. Watching your distance works. Washing your hands works. But behavioral communications that, that support people's behaviors so that they actually do these things, because there's no point implementing all of these things if people don't follow them, if they don't wear the masks, if they don't get their tests and isolate themselves or quarantine themselves if they're positive. Ventilation we know is really important with coronavirus. Open up your windows every day. This makes a huge difference. Cleaning surfaces and finally vaccines. And the idea here is that test zone is a, is a provider. And this is a, this is a diagram from our website that we'll share with you. Um, test zone is a provider of a solution, uh, a, a program, a multi-layered program of different interventions that on each one on its own is not a solution, but together 
they, they bring um, an increased level of prevention and also mitigation or control of, um, of outbreaks if you do get the virus within your safe space. So that's a little bit the how of what we do. So David's given you the why, why are we together? And that's a little bit of the how, but I think um, I might hand off to you, Mike, to give a little bit of the more concretely the what or how do we apply this um, in, in the real world? Great, thanks Gus. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everybody. Very nice to, to be here and thank, thanks again, Arthur, for the opportunity. Um, so as David and um, Gus have already said, I have a background in uh, diagnostics um, R&D. So I've, I've worked for a number of different uh, companies um, around, the, around the US and have expertise in a, a, a lot of different technologies from big lab automation um, systems down to very simple um, rapid tests that are, are used very widely in public health campaigns and you would have all heard a lot about in, uh, in this pandemic. And so um, I, I left the corporate world um, earlier this year and started consulting. And uh, my first, or one of my first big um, consulting jobs was with the, um, with the government, as Gus said, for the diagnostics arm of Operation Warp Speed. So this is a program called RADx for the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And the US government through the, through the NIH <clears throat> deployed over half a billion dollars to accelerate the development of um, rapid tests, point of care tests. So antigen and, and molecular um, testing with the, the sole purpose of helping the country reopen um, workplaces, schools, and so on. So the idea being that these tests would be deployed at college campuses at workplaces, not in the traditional um, places where these, where, where these tests typically go. And um, so you think of doctor's offices and clinics and emergency rooms and so on um, is it, it, the traditional, um, traditional environment. And so what we found really early on and, um, and, and continues um, to this day really is that pretty much every diagnostics company who's developing a point of care test right now is thinking for their distribution and, and go-to-market strategies to go to the normal channels, the big traditional distributors like the McKessons and the Shines, Cardinal Health, and then they get sold into these point of care clinics and, and, and emergency rooms. And no one was really thinking about how to set up the um, channels to deliver these tests into these non-traditional places, into workplaces and schools where they're desperately needed. And no one was thinking about how to um, implement these tests. And so it's not just straightforward. You can't just show up and hand someone a test and say, go for it, you know, test yourself. Um, the, the infrastructure and the training and the expertise around deciding what test to use, then how to, how to implement it is, um, is a, a very difficult, um, very difficult proposition for, for traditional workplaces. <clears throat> and so this is where, this is where test zone, test zone comes in and where our, where our expertise and our services, um, come in. And so, uh, met David actually through indirectly through, um, my association with RADx and we started, um, sort of building out, building out our, um, partnership and thinking about how we could, um, how we could support. Uh, various workplaces. And I thought what I might do just to, to start before I talk about what we do is to, to just talk through some of the industries and how they've, how they've struggled to, um, to support, uh, support staying open in, in this environment. <clears throat> and so I think in, in general, and this is based on a, you know, a lot of conversations we had with customer conversations that, that we have, um, and you can basically see it, see it everywhere where yourselves. So Industries where people can work at home quite easily, um, generally have large office populations, are really reluctant to do anything more than maybe temperature check on the way in. So testing programs don't really come into it, and there's sort of very minimal um, effort and, and investment in, in reopening their workspaces. When those um, businesses turn into manufacturing um, operations, that becomes a little different. You, you can't work manufacturing remotely. And um, some industries are a lot more dangerous than others are required to be um, due to due to close proximity that workers have to have to be to each other. And I think that the early example that that I'm sure everyone's familiar with is the meatpacking industry, and the 
huge outbreaks that, that um, they had early on in, in the pandemic. And this led to um, some really intensive testing programs and millions of dollars being spent by these companies to enable their, their businesses to stay, stay open and, and their workers to remain safe. Um, but that's but that's still somewhat rare in the manufacturing um, world. So so most manufacturing um, most manufacturing locations will rely on distancing, mask wearing, maybe a temperature check, and symptom uh, symptom monitoring on, on the way in, and then a really robust contact tracing um, effort once once uh, a case of uh, a case of COVID is identified. So the um, so that so then we move on on to um, colleges and. Colleges have been highly publicized as um, as doing either a great job or a really bad job at, at preventing um, spread of spread of um, COVID and outbreaks of COVID. And it pretty much tracks with which colleges have testing programs <clears throat> and which colleges don't. And you see a, um, a pretty significant uh, increase in um, COVID outbreaks in the colleges that didn't test, and quite a bit of evidence that that supports that in these in these campuses where they didn't test and they have these outbreaks, in the surrounding communities you're seeing um, increased death rates from uh, from COVID, and so the testing programs um, appear to work not only to keep the the campuses open and allow more in person um, in person learning, but also keeps the surrounding communities safe. Where you, you have the, the higher risk, um, the higher risk populations, and so the um, probably the best example of, of effective testing programs is in the Northeast, and the Broad Institute, which is a a, um, a research institute, a nonprofit institute um, that, that's associated with MIT and Harvard. They have provided to over 200 schools um, PCR lab testing at cost, so relatively very inexpensive. And to do this, they set up a, a small company called Coverified to develop an app to help with um, to help with result reporting, test scheduling, symptom symptom tracking. It has a health passport in it, and um, what was very sex successfully um, implemented in these schools. So millions of millions of test results um, being reported from the broad, and we have. Um, formed a really strong partnership with Coverified um, as part of our um, part of our solution that we offer offer customers. And so the Coverified app helps us manage testing and other um, the behavioral programs that Gus talked about um, with our with our customers. And so I think as you sort of move through industries and, and maybe I'll just jump to probably one of the most sophisticated um, from a from a COVID health perspective, Industry that that's out there, and that's the entertainment and the, the film, particularly the film and, and TV production industries, and the um, the pretty much um, driven by the necessity to to have really strict um, strict protocols in place. Probably one of the most dangerous from a COVID perspective industries out there. If you think about the close unprotected contact that actors and the the crew that uh, support them. Um, need to have while they're while they're um, on camera, and you need to make um, darn sure that those people are not um, are not infected by the time they go on set and and um, shoot those scenes. <clears throat> and so there's been a whole infrastructure that's been really driven by um, the entertainment industry unions. So um, SAG, DGA, Teamsters, um, IATC uh, have done a really nice job. They created a, a consolidated guidance. Um, document that basically instructs productions how to keep their sets safe, and this has been used as a as a guide to um, to to productions to to um, to keep that their sets as safe as possible. It spurned a cottage industry of um, providers who will provide the solutions um, to the various elements of of these these guidances. So it goes from testing to um, to occupancy calculations based on on the size of a room, the airflow through a room, PPE, decontamination, uh, disinfection, how how people sit, how they move, where they go, and, and every location that they go, these these protocols are being put in place. It's created a, a new department, so the COVID um, the COVID safety department <clears throat> that is 
staffed by medical experts and production experts to help um, put these protocols together. And we're actually working right now in New Orleans with a, um, with a, a large film production to provide them with um, an, an all encompass, encompassing service to, to deliver the, the safety protocols that they need. And what, which is, um, and what we've, what we've learned. I'm yeah. sorry, it's created a department in, in what, where? Oh, sorry. In, yeah, so in the, in the um, production uh, companies. So as they set up a, you know, you, you have your cast and crew and then amongst the crew, you'll have the producers, the ADs, the um, gaffers, grips, and so on. Now there's a COVID department gotcha. and it's, it's, yeah. It's costing somewhere in the order of 10 to 20% of a film's budget to, to um, run these protocols. So it's a, it's a sizable investment. And for the most part, um, everyone in the industry is, um, is supportive of the, of, of the effort. They, they realize that their livelihoods depend on it and, and the safety of their, their friends, families, and, and coworkers. So it's a, it's a very interesting, um, very interesting uh, environment and hugely complex and um, so much variation in, you know, where, where movies are shot, the, the day-to-day -day changes in, in locations and numbers of people who get close to each other. And it, it creates a, a huge logistical challenge. And, that it, and it's, being, it's being solved by a lot of companies need to hire two, three, four different vendors to provide them with the support they need. Testing vendors, medical staffing vendors, um, other vendors to, to set up the different, different types of medical staffing vendors for collecting swabs, for, um, for providing telehealth services, and, and so on, rapid, rapid um, testing services. And so it's, it's you know, really, really complicated, difficult, and, and oftentimes messy when you've got these different, um, different vendors being coordinated by someone who's not an expert in the area. Um, and so this is where we're finding that we really differentiate and we're providing a, a, a really um, powerful, important, important service to, these, um, to these, these production sets. So we can, we can come in and with one invoice provide that entire health security service. We hire up the, um, the medical staff who are needed to, to oversee the, the safety protocols. We find the labs, we find the rapid tests, we find the staff to support those, um, those rapid tests. and you know, at, at the end of the day, the, um, the, the production company feels very secure. They've got an independent, um, independent entity who's overseeing their safety and they can go, go about their, go about their business. And so I think, you know, in, in many ways we were, we were built to serve this, um, film production market and, and other, um, markets that are, um, as complicated. So you can think about sports, um, you can think about, as David said, travel and um, and tourism, and so we, uh, you know, with 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 the, I guess, process muscle that we that we put in place to be able to serve these um, these markets, we can we can replicate that um, across industries and and uh, throughout the throughout the globe. So I think um, you know. So basically, our, our our business model is to to just find piece together all these solutions through our, our network um, expertise and um, the, the networks and expertise of our advisors. We contract with test providers, with labs, and with, with um, the, the medical community to, to provide these, these complete programs to, to support testing and COVID safety uh, at, at workplaces. So I'm you, you sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. So we're going to get the next season of billions in succession. Is that what you're saying? I hope so. I'd, yeah. I'd also like to see Ozark. <laughs> Ozark, me too. Yeah. So, Arthur, uh, so this is a, is a good segue into the future because, you know, we imagined that companies would need us. Then companies had to realize they needed us. They, they needed us. Uh, certain of them tried by themselves uh, and certain did quite a good job if the let's just say the Swiss cheese was relatively uh, uncomplicated, like if it was a single application. But when they start to get complicated, this is where you need sophisticated providers. And this is exactly what Testone was set up for. And what's happened to us, especially when people started to realize that COVID ain't going away that quickly, but business needs to continue. Actually content 
uh, the, the consummation of content, streaming content at the moment is there's enormous pressure on the content providers to come up with new content. I think people are tired of uh, watching the same, uh, the same episodes over and over. So it's just a great example of why we were at the right place at the right time. And now it is coming at us quickly. Literally our issue at the moment is how can we scale? How big can we scale? How quickly can we localize? Uh, how we structure ourselves regionally, how we um, uh, do these master agreements with big testing facilities, uh, rapid testing facilities, get right on the edge of the, of the, of the antigen wave as it comes out of the EUA, uh, as it gets its EUAs from the FDA. Um, and so we're forming these alliances, basically supply alliances from healthcare uh, uh, personnel suppliers to testing labs to to PPE suppliers etc cetera, etc cetera. and we become this one-stop shop for anybody who's got a problem or is identified that they need a problem so that takes us through 2021 we believe pretty smartly in fact we're expanding as fast as we possibly can um, we're actually trying have to be a little bit picky right now because it's coming to us as quickly as it is and so obviously we're, we're going to the places where we can make the most dramatic difference. Uh, the places where the solutions are really complicated. Mike didn't tell you, but for instance, one of our photo shoots, one of our film sets is so far away from any medical center that we have a small plane delivering samples every day to an urban center. This is the type of sophistication one needs when it gets really complicated. Um, so obviously we're getting known, word of mouth is spreading, the phones are ringing and we're writing business. Um, that's perhaps why, you know, um, uh, perhaps why this is not a, a, a pitch call, uh, Arthur, but more uh, an information call because um, a, lot of these, uh, a, a lot of these customers have, uh, let's just say cash to give us to make, to ensure that we secure them. And so we found ourselves funded mostly by, um, by customers prepaying certain aspects of this and by um, vendors giving us some credit. So we've managed, and because we came from a funded incubator, we've managed to keep our heads above water pretty smartly. So where does it go past this? This is really the key. Is this going to be the great fire of London that becomes the need for smoke detectors in your house? We believe so. We believe that, that business owners can't just sit back and hope for the best anymore. We saw how that ravaged uh, um, the economy. And we want to develop ourselves into a nuanced company that can be thought of as the first company in the world that was focused solely on health security, bringing you a sophisticated solution to secure you. And we know that, yes, with what's happening in the world, this is not gonna be the last pandemic. And we don't believe actually there's gonna be a hundred years till the next one. We actually think that there are environmental things at play right now that's gonna accelerate the amount of pandemic or the amount of variations on pandemic we might see. But we don't only think about infectious disease, pandemic lifestyle infectious disease is the only threat that a business or an institution faces. There are multiple other levels of, of airborne uh, waterborne, insect-borne diseases. There's food, how food comes into you, uh, a disease that arrives on food or is put into food during the food preparation process that we hear about outbreaks. And another thing that we know for sure, that there are pollutants out there in workplaces that people are maybe not getting sick from them uh, because they were exposed to them for a day or for an hour, but they're getting sick from them because they exposed to them for years. And this is why we start seeing clusters and issues around certain types of industry. So the identification, this smoke alarm identification of when you might be getting a small doses of something every day, this is health security. So it's multifaceted. It's protecting you from your food supply chain. It's protecting you from pollutants. It's making you understand and mostly we think every CEO or every dean of a university needs to have a radar. This was what was lacking. You need, nobody would get up and fly in an airplane and not switch on their radar. You don't want to see the plane that's coming toward you about two seconds before it hits you. So what we are going to do as a company 
uh, through our advisory board and through our founders is become a, a health security radar for our customers. The ones that want to know where the next health threat is, how far is it away from me? How can I prepare for its arrival at my door? And then how can I deal with it when it arrives? This is the future of Tessa. We have one question here, if you don't mind taking one now, David, is that all right? Of course. Uh, actually, it's two. How does variant of COVID affect the testing? I can take that. Um, so you may have seen FDA sent out a, a notification um, last week that there were three tests, three of the over 100 tests that are um, on market that could be impacted by, um, by the variant, but likely weren't. Um, and so the, uh, so far the impact seems minimal. In fact, one of those tests was the, the, the most widely used um, lab PCR test. And it doesn't, it doesn't stop the test from working. It just, it gives you um, a result that needs to be looked at a little, a little further um, by the lab. So you'll still, you'll still get a positive result. And they're actually, um, some labs are, are using that change in performance as a way to track the prevalence of the, um, of the, the variant. And so it's, um, you know, it's something that the diagnostics manufacturers and FDA are keeping a really close eye on. I think in this environment, we're still in this emergency, <clears throat> emergency um, environment. Uh, if, a, if a test, if a, if a manufacturer's test is significantly impacted by a variant that, that comes later, they can very quickly um, redesign around it and get that, get that modified product out into, the, um, out into the, the testing space. Wow, that's really good news. Wow. Yeah, but that's but I but I think um, you know far less concerned about the impact on diagnostics than the impact on vaccines, and um, and there's a couple of reasons for this concern. One one is obviously if um, if a variant uh, makes the virus invisible to um, to the vaccine, then you know the vaccine is basically um, not not able to do its job. There's some early studies that have shown that the um, the South African and um, and UK variants are not um, impacting the at least the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, um, but that's that's going to be ongoing work that that the the vaccine companies will need to need to monitor. The thing which makes you which is really concerning about the impact on on vaccines um, is that the um, the virus. The, because because the, vac the vaccine is preventing um, viral infections, uh, if if a vaccine isn't properly delivered, so if you have one dose and not two, um, and if if a virus is able to change and mutate and avoid the the vaccine, then it will it will start uh, start up a, a new variant. So that so the virus is picking up mutations all the time. Most of them don't mean anything. But there's this process called selection, and if you, it's like you can you can think of it in terms of antibiotic resistance. And if you don't properly finish a course of antibiotics, then bacteria in your gut can then um, develop resistance, and those resistance strains will then will then take over. And so it's a, it's a similar similar type of um, type of process. And Just Mike, we have a variant that's um, seems to be. Uh, substantially more transmissible, but not necessarily as pa uh, any more pathogenic. But what that means is that more people will get it, the virus will circulate more rapidly. And so just what Mike's talking about, this selection pressure will increase, which will mean that we're likely to see more mutations coming uh, through that may well um, uh, impact testing, impact uh, the efficacy of vaccines, et cetera. We're, we're entering, uh, a long period of uncertainty. We're a long way from coming out of this pandemic. Vaccines are not a magic bullet as much as we'd like them to be, as much as I'd like them to be, having worked on vaccines for 15 years now. Um, they're gonna increase the selection pressure. We don't know if the vaccines um, uh, actually prevent vaccinated people from shedding virus and, and infecting other people um, there are so many uh, uncertainties still coming that I think our, 
test zone is is one of our offers is to help bring a level of certainty in this i think long period of uncertainty that we still have ahead of us over so <clears throat> Uh, another question, what qualifications does someone need to manage the test zone on site? So as with pretty much every question related to um, COVID, it depends. Um, the, the, you know, if you've got a, a site where it's just very simple um, PCR testing and you've got a self-collect and you just need someone to manage the logistics of, of moving, moving samples around and, and helping solve problems with uh, with the co-verified app, then it could be <clears throat> it could be someone without um, without any health or medical uh, background or training or, or diagnostics training. Although we we like to um, we like to uh, provide um, a certain level of of professionalism, and so people with with some sort of background are, are preferred there. Um, in a in an environment like um, a film production then you need people who ha definitely have at least um, nursing, EMT um, types, of, types of experience. And it, it also depends on the, depends on the role at the, at the site but, um, and the industry too. So people with some industry expertise so they know how to fit into, the, fit into that work, workplace are important. I would, I would add to that, um, that I would say that there's two levels. There are the level where you really need a lot of expertise and then there is a kind of industry that's spurned out of that of people that, uh, that are handling some samples or are driving the samples from a remote location to a lab. And here we find actually we can be an incredible provider of work uh, because there's a, there's a solution that everybody needs. And there is also um, funds available for the solution, depending on the economic uh, pressure that the business is facing. Um, and so we can pay relatively high um, um, salaries uh, per hourly and, and, and global salaries uh, to people uh, who, who will come and, 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 and staff our sites. And we found that uh, because we're staffing so many sites simultaneously, uh, we found that uh, we're not having a big problem when we start to offer double or triple minimum wage. Uh, to find the, the type of help we need, especially because so many people are just sitting at home uh, without work, uh, hospitality people. Um, interestingly enough, Arthur, we think of ourselves as a hospitality company as well, in the strangest way. We, we, we want uh, the face of Tesson to be that friendly face that you grow to trust, uh, the people that are making me safe, the, the doorman on your building that you've known for 10 years. Uh, this is the kind of the concierge uh, totally. in, a, in a good hotel. So we actually like to, to, to think about ourselves as a service company in this respect. And we want from day one for people to think of us as friendly because some security looks unfriendly uh, by nature. <laughs> some security providers, you know, by nature look pretty, pretty menacing. Uh, but we're the opposite. We're, we're the people that want to welcome you back want to welcome you back to the cinema, want to welcome you back to the sports stadium, want to welcome you back to your office and, uh, and, and build this type of trust. In fact, one of my first conversations I ever had with Gus said, and I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed now how true this is gonna, gonna be if you understand what our plans are for universities for the, for, the, for the fall semester, is when people trust you, it'll be easier to get a vaccination from you. So, because you've now become this trusted source that people are very used to seeing on campus, et cetera, et cetera, and they start to trust you. Now, the convincing people to be vaccinated might, might, might be easier. So actually these layers of services that we give, including hopefully uh, big inoculation programs in co college campuses in the fall when students come back and enough vaccination will be available to that age group, uh, we think could be, um, another slice of Swiss cheese that we're supplying uh, as the year rolls. Yeah, super interesting. A um, couple more questions, is that all right, guys? Sure. Uh, what is your opinion on high cycle time PCR tests? And would you be as liberal in your testing for business? I'm gonna give that to David. <laughs> 
So, um, so that's a question about sensitivity. He was being facetious. So the, the you can, you can is, fail yeah. on that if you want. <laughs> David doesn't have the science background, but um, it, it's um, yeah. Again, it depends. So it's a question about about sensitivity and with uh, you know PCR tests, lab PCR tests are the most sensitive tests um, out there, and <clears throat> in some environments they're too sensitive. Um, they they uh, particularly when you're screening asymptomatic populations because they, they detect, they're able to detect the, the viral genetic material long after a person is infectious and you're just shedding, shedding um, basically degrading uh, virus. And so um, <clears throat> if you're just uh, randomly um, testing people and you're, you're a little concerned about um, picking up too many people and getting too many people out of the population, not a great not not a great situation. You'll you'll be quarantining and isolating and, and shutting things down unnecessarily. Um, and so the, the high cycle time means it's just how long do you let the test run? And the longer you let the test run, the the, the fewer copies of, of uh, viral RNA you can you can pick up. And so in a in a production environment though, where you're in a um, when you're in a super risky uh, environment and there's a testing cadence where you're testing three times a week. You want to be able to pick up an infection as early as possible before they're ideally before they're um, infectious on the on the incubation period side. So, you know, in, in production, I would um, I would lean towards a, a more sensitive um, a more sensitive PCR test. In a college campus, you know, maybe maybe not so much. Not such a risky environment, and that's where um, rapid antigen tests also come in. So, they're even less, uh, quite a bit less sensitive than uh, than a PCR test, but they're probably um, the 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 incubation period or, or the time after infection that they're that they're detecting disease is probably that infectious period, and so it, it works well in in those programs for a lower cost um, lower cost alternative. So one one other question is, and you touched on it, David, uh, while we're there's so many unknowables about how long this pandemic is going to last and strains, et cetera. There's no way to predict, but let's just say it's going to go on for a while. Post pandemic, what is the ongoing value of the company? Uh, let's assume we. Yeah, um, it's a good question because we're not, um, we're, we're banking on the fact that we'd like to be as proactive and get known as well as we can through 2021. Um, that's why we using this a, a bit, Arthur, as a coming out party for ourselves. But you'll see us getting very active on as talking heads. Um, you'll see us being very active in public relations. Uh, you'll see us um, uh, talking with our customers and having them evangelize what we did for them and how we and how we created solutions for them. Because we do believe that at the moment we're in an operational phase. In other words, we're operating with Swiss cheese because we're coming into an existing pandemic. And we think our role will morph into a more maintenance stage. More customers we pick up and the more people who hear about us might be interested post pandemic in having us as a service provider, as a health security service provider. The best um, analysis uh, that I can give you is cybersecurity. It's like we believe that people wouldn't have ever thought that because they were attacked by a certain virus and bought, you know, version 1.0 of Norton, uh, that they were okay forever. I think that those first virus, the first time a human being plugged themselves into a wall and got attacked, uh, I think it was spam at the beginning and, and pop up advertising and then some more um, horrific stuff started happening and ransomware and stuff like that. People started to realize if you don't have a robust idea of what's out there, what's coming, and good companies around you to help you deal with that security risk, you're just waiting for the next cyber attack. And you're gonna be, and you're gonna be um, let's just say, uh, surprised when all the social security numbers of all your customers are now in the dark web. So we're hoping that, that businesses and institutions will start to realize that it's actually their, fiduciary responsibility to do their stakeholders, to create um, uh, protection mechanisms for themselves. And so we think that at time of low risk, 
will be great concierges, great monitors, great radars, uh, uh, people coming in to identify where your risks might be and help you mitigate those risks before they happen. And at times of high threat levels, we'll spring into action as we're an expandable business and come in with actual solutions to our customers uh, to address issues as they're happening. So kind of like a company that will sponge down and up like security companies do, supplying maintenance services and then operational services to deal with threats when they're, when they're live. Yeah, I love it. Recurring revenue and you're the incumbent. So exactly. you're unseated. Uh, Gus, you wanted to add to that? Uh, maybe just from an infectious disease perspective, um, you know, this is not the last pandemic. In fact, Mike Ryan of the WHO said that a couple of weeks ago. He said, this is not the pandemic. <laughs> so, you know, it's good to hear. There, there are, there are um, all sorts of environmental pressures as people, as humans push into um, virgin forest, as we have uh, some of the, some of these um, wild animals that that carry many many viruses that have never been in contact with humans come in contact with our domestic animals or us uh, we're going to have more pandemics and we're going to have worse pandemics um you know the the, the spanish flu pandemic uh, killed a substantial proportion of the global population um, so even at an infectious disease level this is not over yet and there will be more to come. This virus will continue to circulate probably forever now. It'll become a bit like the, the flu. Um, it'll, it may not morph as fast as the flu, but all we'll need is one variant to pop up here and we may need new vaccines. We've seen a variant that's increasingly transmissible. Suddenly infections are exploding in the countries where that is. So, um, you know, the, I, the maintenance phase will be important, but we'll probably have operational substan a substantial number of operational phases as well. <laughs> I'd just like to add to that on the, on the flip side of the coin. Yeah. The, the, the stake that drives its way through this, all these layers of Swiss cheese, doesn't matter what, what we're looking at, which, which particular problem you're trying to address in health security is the IT solution, is the thing that's being provided to us by CoVerify because it's a two-way story. It, it, it allows reporting and it allows you to monitor. So if you would think of it, like if I was a responsible business in 2022, when you are on the maintenance program of Tesla, you have somewhere in your, in, in your enterprise campus, a, 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 a dashboard where you're monitoring what's going on from a health perspective of your population. I give, we, we, we always use this example. Let's just say, for instance, we got an entire college campus onto CoVerify. They're on many, many, this app is available on people's phones. But can you imagine if normally, if you ate something bad at the cafeteria, right? Because they will say something happened. Um, and you you'd normally go to the toilet, have a bad time, drink water, and then two days later emerge. But imagine if you just hit a button on your CoVerified app to say, I had really bad diarrhea and I ate at such and such a place last night and 14 other people reported that symptom to a central dashboard. You'd know you have a problem in that kitchen and you better go find out what that problem is before you have a very big problem on your hands. So it's just a silly little example of what happens when you communicate around health, when there's this two way conversation between the people you're providing security to and the people who are monitoring themselves and reporting back to you. The other big one that Mike and I are fascinated with is mental security, like mental health security. Like where are these people that are a threat to themselves and a threat to the people around them? Yeah. And how do, and how, about and how, do, we, how do we identify that, that as a health risk uh, that a health security company should be identifying and monitoring? So it's almost, we could go on for hours, uh, Arthur, with how huge this hole is that nobody's filling. Yeah. I totally get it. Um, that's super helpful. All right, um, we're gonna have to wrap it up here. If you guys have any more questions, send them along. We'll we'll answer them uh, in a, in the few minutes that we have left. So we'll get answers to you. Please uh, do that. We have uh, Glenn. Did you want to? I I gave you a lot of trouble earlier publicly. So do you want to publicly chastise me or no? No, not at all, actually, Arthur. Thank you very much for giving the company the forum because the, the, the goal, the underlying goal for all the founders of this company 
is to make the world a safer place, frankly. And it's sincere and, and it's uh, really the, the motive of everybody here having labored real hard for the last six months. So I thank you also for exposing us to your community. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. Um, the, uh, this was really, really interesting and I learned a lot even though I had some background on it. We have one more question real quick and then maybe David, I can hand it to you after this question to sort of wrap up comments. Uh, what are your thoughts on the recent problems that Curative has had in Los Angeles and how could Tetzone help that? I don't know what that is, you guys might, but if you don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, so um, Curative has a <clears throat> FDA issued, a, um, I guess, a, a warning against <clears throat> the Curative device, which was um, giving a lot of false negative results. Um, that I'm not too familiar with um, what led to that uh, letter from the FDA. I was just looking at the at, at the curative um, at the curative emergency use authorization, and it doesn't look like a very a particularly sensitive test anyway out of the gate. And, and I think um, without without um, I think I'll, I'll make a more general comment about this. And the fact is that where you know this is the risk that everyone takes, industry, people, doctors, FDA takes in an emergency environment such as we're in. Yeah. And there is such a huge demand to get, um, to get testing um, out so that people can, can start testing. <clears throat> and um, that the, the standard sort of regulatory processes cannot be, cannot be followed. So you're not, there's just no time and no samples available, quite honestly, to be able to properly validate the performance of the test with, with the, 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 types of, um, the types of studies that you would typically do. So where, where, you, might, where you might test you know, hundreds of positive clinical samples to establish performance claims and, and your sensitivity with a, an emergency use authorization, 30 if you're lucky, and um, you know, FDA sets a bar at 30, but a lot of them were just contrived samples anyway. So you take a negative nasopharyngeal or saliva sample and you just spike in purified viral RNA and um, use these samples just to show that the product's working, which misses a huge degree of vari variability that you'll um, experience out in the field. And so it's just- um, The yeah. consequence of rapid testing. I mean, rapid approval or what? Rapid, de rapid development and rapid approval and just the fact that it's just not possible to get enough samples to um, early on to be able to, to um, validate properly. So, yeah. So just before I hand it to you, David, just uh, everybody, thank you for being here. I'm gonna make sure that you're connected directly with the company and you can um, you welcome to speak with them directly and, and uh, inquire further. Um, David? Yeah, so thank, first of all, Arthur, thank you so much for allowing us to use your forum. Um, we, we really appreciate it. I think our message is an important one uh, from an educational perspective. Uh, there are two uh, possible see you later comments. <laughs> Number one is, I know a lot of people uh, in the family office community are invested in a lot of companies and these companies might be each one of them facing their own issues. Uh, we are open to discussions to see whether test zone, um, uh, test zone uh, ideologies and methodologies are relevant and we can spring into action and make a difference in, your, in these companies. And also we're, we're, we're moving cautiously with growth in that we don't, uh, failure at test zone is not an option. So we, we've got to, we're striding to make sure that we're giving fantastic service and making a difference at the places and the contracts that we've so far done. But as we get more confident, uh, we'll, be, we'll be growing. And so there might be a need uh, for growth capital in this company in the future. Um, so if this idea is interesting uh, to anybody on this call or anybody in the network, um, register your interest with us. Uh, because based on acceptance rates and our confidence in, in applying ourselves to uh, people starting to realize that they need us, uh, we might need to be back uh, talking after, uh, through you once again to see whether there are people who would be excited in joining forces with us. With pleasure and joy. 
Thank you. You can invite Glenn. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> thank you so much, Alpha. Yeah, thank you all for being here. And you guys were amazing. Super, super good presentation. And also, thank you for everybody, as I always say, uh, sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Really appreciate the community. Family Office Insights has been amazing to, to everybody it touches. Uh, and that's not because of me, it's because of you. So thank you all. Thank you. The next time. Take care. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Arthur.